let's just start with the Hail Mary. So, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Um, so, this is our final class on wisdom, so hopefully we'll get through this. Um, and so before I start, any questions from last time? Oh, yes, go ahead. Uh, not so much last time, just general. I was reading the introduction to the book of James in my St. Joseph edition. And James, uh, in the New Testament, it, the introduction says it's wisdom literature. Um, I'm wondering why, do you agree, or uh, it's just the introduction, it's not inspired to comment or anything. Um, I, the same way I said parts of, um, parts of Genesis and parts of Exodus are wisdom literature, I would definitely say parts of James is. I mean, yeah, that'd be clear, but I wouldn't consider all of it, if that makes any sense. Because any, like, wisdom literature gives you kind of some morality, but not of rules, but more of maxims. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'd say in that sense it is, parts of it is. Other parts I'd say no. But, so, just going, today we, I want to cover two, and that's Sirach and the Song of Songs. And the same way I said, like, Proverbs is this optimistic art teacher uh, Koheleth is more like me, very cynical, challenging everything. Um, Sirach, um, if you had to pick him as a figure, he'd be like this very wise grandfather. And literally, Sirach is a grandfather. Um, and we have his writings from his grandson. And Sirach is known as Ben Sirach, which is just way of, in Hebrew, saying um, son of Sirach. And it's the longest of the wisdom books, but actually his name was Yeshua, son of Eleazar, son of Sirach. So, do you guys know what the name Yeshua is in English? Jesus. Um, so, really, I think it should be called the Book of Jesus. <laughs> and I just meant that because um, a should be, and b Jesus is a wisdom teacher. Um, and so I really like all the books. I think it foreshadows Christ's teachings. And so who Sirach was, is he clearly had kind of this uh, very experienced life. He was in politics. Um, and then from his own remarks, he became, he started this school in um, Jerusalem. And so he starts this academy in Jerusalem and he writes down, or his grandson writes down, all his kind of maxims and lessons. And actually, the book of Sirach was used um, as a way to instruct the faithful in the catechumens on moral matters. So really, it's just kind of this the wisdom of this grandfather who's seen a lot of life. The odd part about uh, Sirach is that he uses the historical <coughs> books of Judges and Chronicles and Kings to recount Israel's own history from the perspective of learning wisdom. That's a little bit different. And so it was written about 200 years before Christ, um, and it was translated into Greek. That kind of becomes important because um, uh, at the time of Jesus, Sirach is considered part of the Bible. But like wisdom and a couple things in Sirach, mm -hmm. when Judaism and Christianity got into fight, they basically throughout the book of Sirach because um, and Maccabees for different reasons but one of them was because it was written in Greek but like in 1990 we found this archaeological site where um, we found this ancient copy of parts of the book of Sirach uh, in Hebrew so the only thing that really survives is that very ancient one that we discovered but everything else is Greek translations and that's kind of important because uh, the author's grandson translate into Greek um, about the year 130, 150. And part of it, it's not an attack on Greek culture, because think what's going on at this time. 
the Greeks have overtaken Israel. And um, it's not an attack on Greek culture, but he advocates um, Jewish traditions, but more it's more of a handbook on how to live in a culture that is anti-religious. Does that make sense? How to be moral. Um, but it's, so it's not really, um, it's actually very thought-provoking. And it's quoted in the Talmud. And the reason why it's quoted in the Talmud is because uh, even though it's not part of Jewish tradition, it is, it was originally. So at the time of Christ, it would have been considered. It's part of the Catholic Bible, but obviously not part of the Protestant Bible. Um, because Luther took the later Jewish one, if you know what I'm talking about, Jewish Old Testament. Um, and the themes is living in a culture that is anti-religious. Um, and he advocates living out the traditions of religion as a way of preparing for wisdom. I think that's amazing. Um, I personally like that idea. I don't like the idea of, um, no offense, I'm going to pick on you, but you know, you're religious, so you gain points in heaven. And the more you follow the rules, clearly you get points in heaven. I think that's actually a very dangerous and, no offense, ignorant <coughs> theology. And yet, I don't mean to be cruel, I think probably half of our parishioners have that theology. Sirach's theology is, no, you practice religion and keep their traditions as a way of preparing for, really, wisdom. In, in our language, it'd be the Holy Spirit. You do these things to prepare your heart for wisdom. That's not gaining points or following rules and regulations. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so it's living in this culture, and um, the second part of the book is kind of like this uh, forerunner of the Beatitudes. It's a lot like the Beatitudes. Like the Beatitudes, that's wisdom literature. It's not rules and regulations, but it is wisdom. And one of the main themes is that Sirach talks about the cultiva uh, cultivation of virtue. And I'm holding this donut in my hand, and <laughs> I have to stop <laughs> to eat it real quick. So um, Sirach talks a lot about the cultivation of virtue. Did, how many people here have read the book, uh, David Brooks, The Road to Character? Really? Only Larry and I? Only the good people. Um, I'm only on the third chapter. Only Barbara and I. Only the good people. Um, I loved it, but the road to character basically is about virtue. That in your life, David Brooks he just writes about gaining virtue. Does that make sense? It's a great book, um, and in some ways. I want you to think of Sirach as the road to character. Like David Brooks, one of his lines is, um, he gets home from work and um, he sees, he's watching his football game and the, the quarterback makes a touchdown and he just goes wild and there's this, um, you know, we are the victory and this over ego stuff. And then he says, and I thought about um, at the end of World War II, and I forget who it was, Barbara, who was it? Bing Crosby. <laughs> it, no, some, you know, some general said, you know, we're just humble that God helped us. And it was just this great speech on humility, and there's no puffing and ego involved. And he, so the huge difference between today's culture and World War II. And Sirach is kind of the same thing. His maxims are pithy and profound and easily memorable. Um, it's very good for an oral culture, but really it's just advocating practice virtue, work on it. Um, don't get sucked into the culture of ego and power. And so there's actually no discernible order to the book. They just kind of come up uh, one after another. Um, but they're often grouping into settings of virtues and duties. So he's trying to just simply, the grandfather is trying to answer the question, what makes for a good life? Um, and there's great meditations on the commandments. Um, there's sections on friendship that are just full of wisdom. Or sections on, and I like this, um, choosing a spouse. 
and Sirach, like the other book, will say, um, the most important decision you make in your life is who you'll marry. And he advocates, you know, um, to young people, don't be swept off your feet by the first person who shows you affection. You know, this is a really important decision. And so, um, other things like the consistency of kindness, um, and just know at the end, you'll be judged. He, Sirach says, at the end of your life, you will be judged. Um, so I just want to read some of them, because I think they're kind of funny. And this is on friendship. A man who has found a friend has found a treasure. A faithful friend is beyond price, and his value cannot be weighed. A new friend is new wine. When it grows old, you'll enjoy drinking it. If you make a friend, make one only after testing him, and do not be in a hurry to confide in him. There are friends who are so when it suits their convenience, but will not stand by you when you're in trouble. Do you, like that's actually really kind of wise. <laughs> uh, this is on self-control. The weight of a man's anger drags him down. The patient man controls himself, and afterwards joy will break out. Um, I love this one on death because it's fear not death. It's your destiny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but it, it's like it's kind of true. I, why fear death? You know it's going to happen. Um, or this one, he has a lot to say on gossip. A lot to say on learning to control your tongue, but I like this one on gossip. Have you heard it? Let it die with you. Be brave. Um, it will not make you burst. But I love that question. Have you heard? <laughs> Let it die with you. Do, I just think that's actually, um, or cussing, which I could certainly use, because yes, I do cuss. A man who has a habit of abusive language will never mature in character. Isn't that like, well, that's <laughs> kind of a killjoy. Um, <laughs> So you have all these kind of maxims that the grandfather said, and then it switches in the middle, middle of the book to this wisdom poetry um, that connects wisdom to the observance of Torah. And the thrust of it, uh, basically this wisdom, the Holy Spirit, dwells with God, and it's really beyond human reason. But the Lord has bestowed wisdom upon all parts of creation, and those who love they will gain wisdom. And so the poem begins with identifying wisdom as um, being before all creation. Wisdom, and that for us it'd be a, the Holy Spirit, existed before creation. And wisdom like this primeval mist that hovered over creation um, still reigns over all parts of creation. And what's kind of this highly mystical image of the tree, the tree of life. Now, the tree of life, you know that's from Genesis chapter 1. But also, if you remember our class in um, Exodus, the Ark of the Covenant is a tree of life. Um, Christ is the fruit on the tree of life. Um, it doesn't say that in wisdom. But um, it makes a point that wisdom is this tree of life as well. It not only creates and sustains creation, but it also feeds us. Um, but human wisdom is fleeting. We would say human philosophy. Human philosophy, it's based a lot on arrogance. Um, wisdom is this relationship with God. And I, I love that image. It's Wisdom is not something in your head like philosophy. It's actually this wisdom, this relationship with God, which is a great definition of the Holy Spirit, too. Um, so it goes through those poems um, and then it gets this theme of wisdom in history and this is a little bit unique for um, wisdom literature so the final portion kind of uh, contemplates the role of wisdom within history um, and to understand this um, a little bit of con this contrasts the Greek philosophy 
and I have to get into a little bit of philosophy. Just be honest if I lose you on this, okay? So the Greeks believed that there was this divine intelligence that ruled the world, world, world ruled creation. And they called that the logos. Um, it, it means logic, but it also can mean word or story. So um, you hear like logos and logic, they're very similar, right? And so this <coughs> divine intelligence seems to rule all creation. And if you're smart, the Greeks would say, if you're smart and educate yourself, your mind is open to this divine intelligence. But the divine intelligence for the Greeks, it was an it. It wasn't a relationship. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so Sirach is kind of contrasting that, that wisdom, in a way, is this divine intelligence that rules the world. But you don't get it by learning cleverness of Greek debate. You learn it by religious observance. You learn it by love. And then this wisdom that guides all creation, it'll be part of you. And I mention that because also the opening of the, the Gospel of John says the word was with, the, the Logos was with God, the Logos is God, and the Logos took flesh in the form of Christ. Does that make sense? We would say Christ is, that's <coughs> literally how the opening of John goes. You have to know a little bit of Greek philosophy for that. But it also would say wisdom took on human flesh. And um, you'd say, Sarek's point is wisdom, this divine intelligence, it also rules creation. It rules human history. Um, that you, it shows God's plan that's disclosed in the lives of the patriarchs and the judges and the kings and the prophets. And the point being, wisdom has worked through the people of God and continues. So it gives this catalog of religious leaders, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Moses, Aaron, and it emphasizes that each of them had this virtue, that God acted through their virtues. But it also s says God did not withdraw his mercy, despite you know the failings of Solomon, um, the, certain kings are just <coughs> awful human beings, Wisdom will even work through, um, not in, but through, horrible people as well. Does that make sense? So um, either way, now this gets into a, a question that people always come up with was, well then, do I have free point? Just John, free will? Does John, is he nothing more than a pawn of wisdom? Believe me, he's not. <laughs> wisdom has, I, no, just kidding. Um, We'd say, well, not a pawn, but you have complete free will to reject or accept it. But wisdom is so clever, even if you choose, you know, to reject God and choose instead of virtue, vice and anger and drunkenness, God will work with that uh, to still bring about God's end. Does that make any, like, I like that image that, um, all right. Be a cad, be worthless, but wisdom will still work in human history. You can't stop it. Maybe you need to gain that experience to, to gain that wisdom and all those virtues. Well, that's not what I'm saying, though. That's, I'm not saying, well, God will work on Tom's horrible sins to somehow still save him. Um, we know that's impossible. Well, Tom has um, the horrible sins and then gain wisdom from them. Well, he, yeah, but that's not really what, yeah, that may be true. But that's not what it's saying. It's saying, let's say Hitler, horrible person. Mm -hmm. Yet, okay, he's not open to wisdom. Right. But somehow wisdom will use that awful, horrible leader to bring about God's will still. <coughs> you can't stop God's will, but you have free will to reject it. But does that make any sense? So, so what you're saying is that he, he doesn't work through that evil, but... What comes after? Yeah, we, we respond to that evil. Right. But even Hitler, God can bring good, not because Hitler is open to wisdom, because wisdom is far more clever than Hitler. So <coughs> Hitler can choose to be evil, but God will s still find some way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Are you talking about directly to Hitler or that we no. see it? And because what we see, society sees Whether we see it or not, God will still <coughs> make it happen. God can... Does that make any sense? I'm not saying Hitler is open to wisdom. No. 
and still not clear? No, it is clear. He's bigger. Yeah. yeah. So it has this part with, it has this unique, only Sarah has this kind of view of history as and wisdom together. And then it kind of closes with this Thanksgiving hymn and this wisdom mechanical. Um, and it ends kind of with this prayer for wisdom. Um, <coughs> what I like most is, um, actually it is kind of a nice prayer, but um, my favorite theme in Sirach is this, small choices matter. Your really tiny little choices like who you choose as a friend, controlling your speech, choosing a wife, um, not letting yourself be carried away with the first person you fall in love with. Like, all those little tiny choices, they'll make a huge difference later on in life. Um, and if you make the right small little choices, life will bloom for you. Um, virtue will bloom. So, to be honest, uh, like, Jerry Perra always reminds me of the book of Sirach. Um, <laughs> Because he was involved in um, politics, and then he became a deacon, and even, like, Jerry does control his tongue. He might truly disagree with what you're saying, but if he feels you're not open to it, he'll just give some polite non-answer. Mm -hmm. Sirach is always about controlling your tongue, and <coughs> what really matters is not the big issues in life. You know, like, should you be a doctor or a... Uh, Carpenter, you know that—that's a big issue that you think really matters. It's not. It's the tiny little virtuous choices that change your your destiny. So, um, any questions on Sirach or the Book of Jesus, as I'd like to call it? There's an awful lot in there for the fact it's yeah. just a little book it's, of Sirach. No, well, it's a big book of Sirach. It's a, actually a long book. Do the Protestants have that book? No. no. It's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> Blame Luther for that. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, you know, this sounds kind of strange, but like if I actually had a class on this. Not the same. Um, It'd be this, for anybody who's a grandparent, if you had to write your grandchildren on what you've learned in life, what would you write? Um, and what if you got 100% on it, that God would be like, yes, yes, yes. That, and so he writes them in little maxims. That's, you can see why it became that kind of this manual for learning morality. And, sorry, this is my big issue, because I face it all the time. Morality is not rules and regulations. It kind of is. You know, like, yeah, it kind of is. But morality is more knowing how to make the right choices. And that's what Sirach is about. So for everybody who's a grandparent, I want you to write your own book of um, Sirach and write it in Greek. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, What's that? You have to have a long life. <laughs> I just think that would be really, what, like, I don't know anybody who's ever done that, but. Uh, I do. Do you? I do, actually, I, I took a, a workshop, and it's uh, a legacy will, <clears throat> where you look at your life. And then Love you that idea. Letter, <clears throat> and you write a letter to um, your grandchildren. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did. Did you really? Yeah. Of the lessons that I learned. Yeah. It's, a great, it's a great experience. It is You'd be amazed what you learn about yourself. So everybody who's a grandparent, which I just think is you two, um, <laughs> Dr. Okay. Gieberts, write your will of, what did you call it? A legacy will. A legacy will. Yeah, That's, yeah. Sarah has a legacy will. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So um, they, no. they open the, the will and they say, forget about the money, here's, here's what I want. Yeah. <laughs> that would be so clever. Like I actually, sorry, I love that. When you die, let me give you a copy of his will. <laughs> it's a legacy will. And you could go one step further. You could do a legacy video. <laughs> we had friends that actually did that and gave us a copy because we were pretty interested to say, wouldn't it be nice to leave something that you explain your life and what life was all about and why you've done what you've done. 
And you know, of course, Barb's dad was an old famous Navy pilot. He was over there at the Warhawk Museum, 91 years old, doing videos about what happened in World War II. Did, did, you, did you see that kid? He's, so this kind of shocked me. This kid, he's in high school, and he loves World War II. Did you see that video? That, he loves World War II, and then he realized, holy cow, the history is still alive. So he starts to travel all around, <laughs> videotaping these interviews with World War II vets. And I love in the TV program where he said, you know, there's so much wisdom there. He said, I've got to record these people. And I thought, what a great kid. And he turns out to be from India. He's an immigrant. Um, Charlie... Charlie Rasmussen also was thinking about doing a video, Will, but it just turned out to be a mixed drinks. Um, <laughs> I put this much gin in my... <laughs> just kidding, Charlie. He's speechless. <laughs> Let's just enjoy that. Okay, moving on. Um, the All right, the princess has got her feelings here again. So, um, all right, the next one, kind of speeding through this, and I know, like, I'm just giving small introductions. The next wisdom one is Song of Songs. Um, and this one goes back to kind of, uh, this one's a real, I love the Song of Songs as well, but it answers a problem, what do you do about suffering? And the Song of Songs answer is, well, how do you face suffering? Double down on love. That's basically the point. Um, and it refers to sometimes a king as the lover, and it's this really novel approach to wisdom. You have Syracuse history, the Song of Songs is, sometimes it's called the Canticle of Canticles, or the Song of Solomon, which I hate, um, but it answers this, gives this distinctive answer for the distinctive approach uh, to gaining wisdom. And the distinctive approach is, um, uh, sorry, uh, you want wisdom? Practice love. And just FYI, you know they're recorded on the website. Um, I oh, we don't like to tell people. Uh, the Song of Songs is actually the shortest in the Bible, just 117 <laughs> verses. Um, but it's one that probably has the most amount of commentary outside of Exodus and Genesis of commentary. Um, it's more mystical, and it's generated so much because on the surface letter, it's just a love poetry, poetry between two lovers. And it has a lot of sensuous details. Um, so if you're skittish about Eros, um, skip it. In fact, 50 years ago, 50 years ago, they wouldn't let seminarians read it because, <laughs> you know, you read that, <coughs> kiss could sell up a single pie. Um, I mean, even 50 years ago, it wasn't read in churches because... It is very sensual, um, some parts of it. But <coughs> the rabbinical way of looking at it is it's really, on the surface, it is a love, passionate love poetry between two lovers. But the Jews would say it's really this passionate love poetry between God and his people. Because remember, in the Bible when it says, when God says you've committed adultery, it doesn't mean that you've broken, you've slept with somebody. It means you are worshiping somebody other than God. That the Sinai Covenant is this marriage ceremony. The Eucharist, it's a marriage ceremony between you and God. And so in the Christian and Jewish view, it's not just a passionate love poetry, it's the passionate love poetry between God and us. And some parts are highly sexual, um, so obviously it's not popular among some fundamentalists. But among the mystics, and the mystics who practice what's called betrothal spirituality, where your spirituality, your prayer life, is this love affair between God and us. So that'd be St. Francis, John the Cross, Teresa of Avila. Um, there's a lot. That, what is your prayer life most like? 
a love affair with God. Um, and so, like, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who is also practiced bridal, uh, betrothal, mis, um, mysticism, he has the most amount of commentaries on it. You know, my lover has kissed me full on the lips, and I long for his kiss again. Bernard is saying that's really, um, that's your prayer life. So it's eight chapters of love poetry. And um, while there's an introduction and conclusion, it doesn't also have a rigid literary device. And that's because it's a collection of poems. And they're not meant to be dissected or taken apart. Um, they're meant to be read one after another and just simply enjoyed. It's called the Song of Songs, and that's just a very Hebrew way of saying um, the absolute greatest. So in Hebrew, you have the Holy of Holies. The Song of Songs is the greatest song of all is love. That's what it's trying to say. And we're told in the first line of the Song of Songs, it's Solomon. But that really makes no sense. Um, personally, nothing in the book really bespeaks Solomon. When it says of Solomon, remember it's during Solomon's reign where he went and collected a lot of wisdom literature from Egypt and Babylon everywhere he could. And so it was probably composed somewhere during the time of Solomon, but nothing really in the book <coughs> reflects Solomon. Solomon is hardly an example of faithful marital love with his, what was it, 500 wives and 300 <laughs> mistresses. Um, hardly an example there. Um, so the opening, its basic theme is that we hear this voice of a young man and this woman who delights in her man, the shepherd, and she's not married to him yet, and they're not even engaged, but they can't wait to be together. And it's very common that the Song of Psalms is read in weddings. Do you guys know that famous line in the Song of Psalms? Hark, here comes my beloved, leaping like a gazelle over the hills. He is a wild stag. <laughs> and, like, no offense, I've had weddings where it was an older couple who were getting married. <laughs> and, really, they were very much in love, I do remember that, but he was overweight and disheveled hair and well, I was looking at him when the oh first read, <laughs> my lover is a wild stag, and I felt like a thing to this, love is blind. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it is very popular among weddings, and the sad part is I, I like that, but the sad part is there's also a little kind of darkness in this poem as well. And the theme is the constant search for love. That love can go deeper and deeper and deeper. And I get starts with this young man outside the, this, it's called an insula, the family dwelling, and he's calling to his beloved. And he's calling and saying, leave safety behind. You're safe there in your family home with your brothers to protect you and all this. Life, and it's a great poem, life is blooming. Life is it's spring, life is butting out everywhere. This is our chance. Be adventurous. Take a chance. Love. And in case you missed it, the idea is that, wow, love is also very dangerous. <laughs> if you're not careful. You know, love can also, you fall in love with the wrong person. It is an adventure, but it also can end up breaking your heart. And so, the beloved calls out, and she wakes from this dream, and she's looking for a lover, and here's the odd part. In the book, the lovers keep calling and finding each other, but they keep losing each other as well. And it does get a bit racy, you know, like, he loves her breasts, where this sh that shape of pomegranates. Um, and so it's, it is kind of sensual and erotic. But the odd part for me is not that. The odd part I could never really figure out is how they find each other and lose each other and then look for each other and then find each other. And it concludes with the lovers who were once celebrated hunting for each other again. 
Now that strikes me as really strange. <clears throat> the poem ends with the lover's call, the lover calling out to the beloved, and so it ends open ended, not in this fairy tale ending, but with them searching for each other again. And the idea is that it doesn't conclude. And I have to admit, um, I didn't totally kind of understand this until, um, like, it sounds kind of strange. I didn't understand until uh, I was in Idaho Falls and after, now I'm, trust me when I say I am busy. I have 10,000 things going on. But 20 years ago in the priesthood, you weren't that busy. And so after mass, oftentimes you'd go out for coffee with the parishioners. I don't, really don't have time for that now. But so we're after mass and we're having coffee and this one lawyer who was a great guy, his wife had died um, and he, uh, he was having a cup of coffee and this one other gentleman in the parish retired. And he said, let me tell you a story what happens when retirement. He said the day um, our last son, they had like six sons, went to college. I came down for breakfast, and my wife looked across at me and said, because now they're empty alone. And he, she said, well, what are we going to talk about now? <laughs> and he said, that was really a great question, because for years, the only thing they really ever talked about was the kids. And suddenly, um, it's just the two of them. And he said, I realized I didn't even know my wife. You know, we were so busy with the kids that they lost each other. And he said, luckily, um, and then she got cancer and died. Luckily, he said, it was like a second honeymoon. But what, and he said to the guy who was retiring, what's going to happen you're retiring with your wife and suddenly you realize we've grown so apart? And what it made me think of is this song of songs that really, I, I don't know anything about marriage. I know nothing about anything. I know less than nothing. But what does happen in a marriage is that I don't think it's the way the movies sound that you find this great, you know, lover, you're passionately in love, you decide to get married. But life is this continual finding and losing of each other. Does that make any sense? And so is your relationship with God. You're, you know, you're busy with your life and the, you lose your beloved, God. Um, and so I, I like that theme. And it gets even kind of scary where, um, so it has, it's kind of cute and it's kind of scary because it has this young, starts off with these young lovers passionately, can't keep their hands off each other, they love each other. And then it ends with this old married couple, same couple, now older, bickering on who closed the door last, which <laughs> part of me likes because I find that very true. You know, it's... It is a great marriage if the thing you have to argue about is who closed the door. Yeah. But or why the lights are still. Yeah. Why the music's too loud. No, no, it it sounds stupid, but like there's this book called Love in the Time of Color. It's one of my favorite. Where um, it's kind of the song of songs they they passionately love each other, and then the book opens with the guy dying because he was stupid enough to climb into a tree and falls out and. He, looks at his wife before he dies and he says, God only knows how much I loved you. But then you get into the history of their relationship and it is kind of like they passionately love each other, they have yeah, problems and they fight about toothpaste and <laughs> you know, silly little things. Um, and the odd part is sometimes they really hate each other. Um, but uh, <laughs> The odd part is this, is that they'd have these tent fights and in this interview, and this really clicked with me, they asked Gabor Garcia Marquez, the guy who wrote it, Nobel Prize writer, he said, in this joke, they said, where did you get this crazy couple that argue about, you know, toilet paper, you know, just crazy little things? And he laughs, he says, well, that was my parents. <laughs> he said, to be honest, my parents really loved each other, but they'd get so mad about something stupid. And as kids, we were like, what is, what is this? Um, and he said, that's when he was like in high school, when he realized real love is not the poet who's lighting candles and throwing. Real love is 
this older married couple who argue about something really stupid. <laughs> um, and so the title of the book, Love in the Time of Cholera, cholera in Spanish is both the disease, but it also means anger. And there, even where you have real anger, there exists true love. It's really nuanced understanding of romance. But I think that's also like the Song of Songs, because they keep losing each other and finding each other. I immediately thought of marriage when you said that, because it's like always an ebb and flow. I, mean, I think that's just life, no matter how good or bad. Yeah. Here's the sad part, though. When they do argue about the closing of the door, it is kind of funny, but it's also kind of sad, because they miss their chance of finding God. And like it's, it has this double meaning. In one sense, it's kind of fun, but how many times have you argued about things so silly that you've lost your way, you've lost a chance of encounter with the design because you're divine because you're arguing about stupid stuff. <laughs> so it kind of has this odd thing. But wis wisdom is gained in the Song of Songs through love. The other theme is, um, and this sounds strange, and this is why it makes some people uncomfortable, erotic love is also a way to unconditional love. That it's this repeated, you have the couples, they enjoy the physical attraction they have for each other, um, but it really becomes this metaphor that um, that physical attraction can work its way into unconditional love and wisdom. Um, and so it paints these metaphors, but these metaphors are supposed to really be um, this tension that, um, yeah, the mystery of sexual love can lead into the mystery of actually who God is. And that's a strong, that's a strong theme. It makes some people very uncomfortable. If it does, I'd say you're immature. Um, but I like this. This it kind of conclude. This summarizes one of the passages that I like. It. Love is as strong as death. Its passions are as severe as the grave. It's the flash. Its flashes are fire, a divine flame. Many waters cannot extinguish love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were given all the wealth of one's house for love, he'd be utterly scorned. The idea is that you can't buy love. But, so you start out with this physical attraction and it ends in this intense, unconditional love that's both beautiful and very dangerous. And the odd part, like fire, fire can enlighten, but it also can destroy. That's what sexual love can do as well. If you're not careful, it can destroy you. But if you're wise, it could lead to unconditional love. Um, so the really strange part is the Song of Song only mentions once Yahweh. Like if it's in the Bible, you think it's going to speak about God. <coughs> but the Song of Song almost never speaks about God, only once. But in this passionate love of loss and finding each other, there's the flash of Yahweh. There's the presence of God um, in finding and losing. Um, C.S. Lewis, <coughs> the song songs reminds me of this line from C.S. Lewis where he says, you fall in love, it will break your heart. Any of the natural loves of having children, um, uh, sex, you know, passionate love, uh, friendship, um, all those natural loves, they're going to break your heart, I guarantee it. And it sounds kind of strange. I remember once I was joking with a friend of mine who uh, they had a baby and they were just so in love with the baby. And um, so I said to Catherine, I said, you know James will end up breaking your heart. And she says, logically, I know this, but right now when I'm looking at my baby, I just can't imagine I do anything for him. However, when he was a teenager, <laughs> I said, do you remember you said, and he says, I still love him. But I, so I called her once because, like, I, I have to admit, I'm a tattletale. Um, I am. You do not want to trust me. So her son James asks this girl out on a date, and he says, I want to take you to McCall. We'll, we can drive up to my parents' cabin in McCall. We'll go to McCall. 
And she was really smitten with that, right? So I'm like, oh, bullshit. <laughs> so um, I call Catherine and I say, Catherine, let me share a little gossip with you. And she just laughs. She just laughs and says, and they're smart enough that their kids do have a car, but they always have to ask permission to use the car. So she laughs and says, well, A, he doesn't have a car. He has to ask permission. B, he doesn't have a key to the cabin. <laughs> so, she said, you know, like she recognized this is total BS, right? And so anyhow, uh, she said, don't worry, I'll handle this. And like, what I love about it is, um, which says, you know, I am working to keep this kid under my thumb. And so that was a couple years ago. So now I saw him this summer, he's turned out to be a very fine young man. Like, wow, they did really great with him. But he was very aggressive. He, do you know, like, you have to put up with that BS. Um, even your children will break your heart. Even if you love them 100%, the person you love will break your heart. That's a, and I think C.S. Lewis is right, because none of those loves can truly sustain it. And C.S. Lewis thoughts, the one thing that your heart will heal is unconditional love, agape, you know, love of God. But C.S. Lewis says, how do you get to the love of God without loving other human beings? And then anybody who says, well, I am just going to love God 100%, that's a fiction. You know, you, you fall in love with a natural love's children, family, friends, your partner. Um, and they will end up breaking your heart, and somehow that's the way of unconditional love. That's how you get to, the, the Song of Songs is kind of making the same point. It's kind of sad, do you see the sad part of it? It's also passionate, but that's how you gain wisdom and love. Um, the other part is that the Song of Songs has a, a little bit of suffering in it. Um, she has this desire to be rescued from slavery. Her son has been dark, her skin has been darkened by the sun. Means uh, she's been in slavery. It, is that her, or is that the story of the people in Egypt when they're in slavery? And the whole point of this whole suffering part is, well, when life causes you pain and suffering, <coughs> the wise thing to do is to double down on love, uh, as I said. But even love becomes this way of wisdom. Um, you have this theme of, like, I, I'm not really covering it well, but also um, love gets you into trouble, where she's searching for a lover in the streets, and they mis the, basically the police mistake her for a prostitute. Um, does, does that, like, the only point that you say, what? Well, you love, you get the wrong impression, and you find yourself even more in trouble, and yet you'll find your love again. Where even after that, she says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is me. And I love that idea that, yeah, love will get you in trouble, but if you stick with love, you'll make it. Um, and of course, the big theme is right. The beloved is the church. Um, it compares, it makes it kind of obvious where it compares the beloved to a city. Um, so who is this woman? Who is the beloved? She's a city. She's a people. It's really the church. Um, okay, there's more there. There's more images of the church, but I'm going to skip that because I'm running out of time. But it does mention also being swaddled. And I just mentioned the word swaddled because why? Good job. Uh, swaddled comes up a couple times in the Bible. And you know how you swaddle a baby? You just wrap it in love. Um, and I'll say God does that with creation, but also that's what lovers do. So when Christ is um, uh, swaddled, it means um, it's really God who wants to swaddle us in this relationship. <coughs> so um, there you go. That's the song of song. Um, there's more to it, but I'm running out of time. Um, it does always crack me up when people find out that there's erotic love poetry in the Bible. Um, I, it really does. So now we're down to seven minutes, and I just want to conclude it. So this is wisdom literature. Uh, the theme today was Sirach. Like a grandfather, you learn wisdom, but you can learn wisdom by studying history. You can learn wisdom by, yes, 
practicing religion. Song Song, you can learn wisdom. Like so, the thing I the thing I like about the Song Song is that what are these people who just leave church? How are they ever going to discover God? Well, there are the natural loves. They'll fall in love. They'll have families. They'll have friends. And tr that kind of natural love always leads to unconditional love. Not always. Take that back. But it can lead. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you can gain wisdom from love. Okay, reactions, objections to this? No. Okay, so really, did, was, Charlie, was that okay for you? Okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, let's see. Oh, the last part is um, just Jesus. Jesus is a wisdom teacher. Um, and like, this is my issue. Among some Catholics and fundamentalists, Jesus came to give a rule book. Well, Jesus does come to give some rules, but he's mostly a wisdom teacher. His morality is more like Sirach, or he challenges like Koheleth. Um, he is, Jesus is very optimistic like Proverbs, but Jesus is wisdom in flesh. He is a wisdom teacher. And I like the image of Mary as a seat of wisdom. There's this image of Mary as, quote unquote, the seat of wisdom. That's not saying Mary is wisdom itself. Mary's made a place, a seat, so that's a, a place for wisdom. Um, I like that image as well. <coughs> so that's it. So with five minutes, I just thought we could share. Who or what determines whether a manuscript or a book is included in the Bible? And could we ever discover something and could it be included in the Bible? I don't think we'll discover anything because the canon of the Bible it was formed fairly early. Um, and really, who, who decided what was to be used? It was really the church. And it was always in liturgy. So the Bible, whether it was Jewish or Catholic, it was always used in liturgy. And then later, like there's this uh, council declares, well, this is canonical. But it isn't, this is my opinion, it wasn't the, it wasn't the, the council that made it sacred. It was its use in liturgy. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's what's so odd about like Luther suddenly saying, well, the book of wisdom is no longer in the Bible. Or, you know, tearing <coughs> up these parts that had been used in worship for years. And will we discover a new one? No. Because they would have been used in liturgy. We might discover, like, we always discover what's called intertestamental stuff. Not always. Occasionally, very rarely, we'll discover some intertestamental thing in, from the time of Christ mm -hmm. or some ancient document. Um, that's just inner. We have a lot of those, but that won't become scripture. So it's not time itself. It's, you know, dating back to the time of Christ and liturgy. This is off the subject, but it's been bothering me this whole Christmas season. Oh, the donut? Yeah, that season. Oh. <laughs> um, but today's gospel had Mary questioning the angel. Nothing happens. Yes. Zachariah, almost the same question. Kick him in the teeth. <laughs> so, so, so how do you explain? I mean, is there an explanation for that, or is it, is it just... Yes, there is. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> that does raise. Um, I'm not really sure what to teach the next adult ed, and I really don't have time. But I like teaching. Um, so the next one, I'm going to do something on church again. I mean, I need some ideas. I can do prophets. I can do. I, mean, I can do something from the Bible. Should we do history? I'm not really sure. But one of them I want to do is Mary. I want to do like maybe three or six classes on Mary. But that's a great marrying question. And the answer real quick is um, that's such a great gospel. But um, So start with Zachariah. Zachariah, only once a year do you get, if you're a priest, once in a lifetime, not once a year, once in a lifetime you get to go into the Holy of Holies. And they tie a rope on you in case you die so they can pull it out, which I love. Um, 
So this is once a year time. And the angel Gabriel appears before him and says, I am Gabriel. That's all he really says. Well, I say he doesn't start off with that. He gives Zechariah the prophecy, and then Zechariah, Zechariah basically says, well, that's not how God works. He doesn't make old women get pregnant. And Zechariah's question is really more of a question of, God can't work in ways that I'm, I don't like. And the angel responds, I am Gabriel. <laughs> um, Gabriel, I love Gabriel because he's the scariest of angels. <laughs> um, he's not the most powerful, that's Michael. And at one point, Gabriel has to call on Michael for help. Um, but Gabriel is the agent of change. And the last time, so before he appeared to Zechariah, when is the last time he appeared? Daniel. And he gives Daniel the message that in 490 years, the Messiah will be born. And um, the prophecy also is that um, there'll be one crying out in the desert to prepare his way. So when he says, I am Gabriel, Zechariah, who's a priest, should have known what that meant, that now it's going to happen. And Zechariah, and people do this all the time, people say, well, God has to work this way. And Gabriel gets really mad. Angels don't have patience. But <laughs> no, don't say that. Um, but who are you to tell God how God has to work? And just Mary doesn't do that. Mary questions the angel, but doesn't tell God how to work. She wants to know how this, you know, how is this? How can this be? That's different than saying God can't work that way. And this is my issue. Like everybody, like I should say everybody. A lot of Catholics love the theory of natural law which I like, I'm not totally against, but natural law has been misused for the reason why blacks are inferior to whites, the reason why women are more inferior to men. And I hate natural law because they'll say, well, God can't work that way. That's basically my problem with natural law. Um, who is that red? The very, to tell God how God can and what way is natural and unnatural for God. So that's why he gets upset. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. <coughs>